You're fine, right there. I have to switch microphones because we have one system that runs only one at a time, and one of these is also linked to that one, so I'm going to switch over here. Very good. <laughs> Everyone's settling in. Well, <clears throat> during the 1970s, as women in the Episcopal Church, alongside the Holy Spirit, opened the hearts and minds of the 1976 deputies to general convention, our moderator for today's discussion was deep in the fight for the ERA, a pioneer in the efforts of turning over the tables on gender inequality right here in Nevada. If you have not already done so, please read her bio in the program, and I invite you to find a copy of her new memoir, which has just been released, When You Dare to Say Yes. Where can they find it? Uh, Amazon. Amazon. And Sundance Books. And Sundance Books. Very, Thanks, very good mix. And so it is truly an honor to have such a moderator here with us today, and I welcome you. What a blessing. We have Jill Derby. Dr. Jill Thank Derby. You, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kurt. And it's, uh, can you hear me? Is my mic loud enough? It's my honor to be here today. And we have an extraordinary panel. There couldn't be a better one in all of the country watching this video with the panel we have today. Before I introduce them, I'm going to introduce them briefly because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions that you've submitted and that we prepared in advance. But before I do that, I want to say so I want to set a frame out of my own experience, an epiphany I had. You know, I'm a cradle Episcopalian, and I grew up, and as a small girl, I was so jealous that I couldn't be an altar boy. And that was my first experience of the sexism of the church, but I didn't know it. I just thought that was the order of things and the way it was made. And it wasn't until much later that I had my eyes opened. But the story I want to share about my epiphany is when I was studying for a PhD in cultural anthropology, the topic I had was the cross-cultural study of women, women in different societies around the world, from simple to complex where they had respect, dignity, where they had authority, where they had power. And it was a fascinating study. And one of the insights that came from that, and it wasn't just mine, but other scholars as well, was the recognition that where women, the feminine principle, is included in the divine order of things, and where women are involved in the practice of the faith, of the religious practice across the world, that's where women had greater status and privilege and opportunity and an opportunity to make a difference. And it was like the light went on from that time I couldn't be an altar boy to that point where I read that and I thought, well, yeah. And it was at a time where we didn't have women priests in the Episcopal Church. And it became abundantly clear to me in that blinding insight that we got to change this. And that's our story today. And what an honor 50 years later and looking back that we have an opportunity to see that documentary and know the story and talk about where we are today and where we've been with just an extraordinary panel. So let me start, and not in the order in which they're seated, but uh, and as I say, their uh, full resumes, bios, are in your programs. But I didn't want to take the time, so be sure to read those, because they come from backgrounds of extraordinary scholarship and, and experience. Uh, we have with us Cash, Catherine Bishop, Catherine Jeffert Shorey. She came to Nevada from Oregon. She served as the 8th Episcopal Bishop of Nevada. In 2006, she was the first woman elected to the House of Bishops 
to be the, in the House of Bishops, to be the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, representing the church. <laughs> Bishop Catherine represented the Episcopal Church of the United States in that worldwide Anglican communion around the world. We also have with us um, nearly a bevy of bishops here today. Um, we have uh, Bishop Elizabeth Bonaforte Gardner. Bishop Elizabeth is currently the 11th Bishop of the Diocese of Nevada. She came to us in 2021 from Washington, D.C. We are uh, honored to have with us today Rabbi Emerita Myra Seufer. <laughs> Maya, I need to tell you, Myra was one of the first 10 women to be ordained rabbi after a 2,000-year history. One of the first ten. <clears throat> Myra came to us from New Orleans. She served 26 years as the rabbi of Temporal, Temple Sinai here in uh, Reno. And I must note that after retirement, she served in the Peace Corps. We also have with us Reverend Ruth Hanusa, uh, who I first knew. Hey, Ruth. I first met Ruth when she was the Protestant minister at UNR and UNLV. She has quite a history with us here in Nevada. She comes to us from the Lutheran tradition, and she's currently chaplain for St. Mary's Hospice here in Reno and candidate Tristan at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. And we're honored to have here with us Reverend Tanya Watt, a recent gift to Nevada. <laughs> Tanya is a recent gift to Nevada and comes to us from St. John's Episcopal Church in Georgetown, Virginia. Was she, when she, where she was ordained to the priesthood in 2019 and is the wife of the very Reverend Timothy Watt, the newly appointed dean, not quite yet installed, but dean of Trinity Episcopal Cathedral here in Reno. We are really, as I said, graced to have such a remarkable group of panelists with us today. And uh, I want to begin by throwing out a question I think that any, anybody would ask, um, looking back. And let me ask of the five of you, and we'll just go down the row. Ruth, start with you, and let's go down this way. The question of how does the story of the Philadelphia 11 inform your own journey into ministry leadership? What resonates from the documentary with you particularly? Ruth, you want to start off? Okay. Um, keep this to maybe three minutes like ish. <laughs> it's short. <laughs> keep it short. <laughs> keep it we short. only okay. we have about forty minutes okay. of at most. So yes, everybody up here could take at least an hour on their own story. So um, I, I would like to focus on some of the similarities. I was ordained in 1979. Um, and when this, um, the Philadelphia 11 was happening in 1974, the seminary that I graduated from was, uh, there was a huge split in my church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. 400 students and 40 faculty walked off the campus. It was ostensibly over um, issues of biblical inerrancy, which of course does affect whether you ordain women or not. The group that walked off was more... Um, liberal, uh, although to say that there were liberal Lutherans in America in the 70s is probably a stretch, but, um, <laughs> but, but relative, relatively so. A and I was, um, I was still a, an undergraduate student at Valparaiso University, but one of the stories that uh, one of the women, uh, I think it was Nancy, said that when she had told her mother she wanted to be a priest, her mother says, well, you can't. 
And I remember that I was 11 years old and I told my mother that I wanted to be a missionary to Africa because I was going to save all those souls. And she said, well, you can't. You can either marry a missionary or be a deaconess. And at 11, I didn't know how to marry a missionary. So I w planned on being a deaconess in my church body, which is what they did with women who should have been going to seminary. But mine was a backdoor thing. Someone else said that I went to seminary because I wanted to study theology. And I did that too, but I couldn't. I didn't think I was smart enough, and I didn't, couldn't find any way to go to any other church institution um, that wasn't from my own tradition. So I ended up at this seminary. Um, I did not wear, um, um, for graduation, I still wasn't wearing clerical collars. Um, I did not wear a clerical collar for my ordination. When I uh, had been ordained about 10 years, I finally went into Macy's and got a suit, two-piece suit, and I was trying it on with collars. I was finally had arrived at that point, backing into the vocation in a sense, and the, the uh, clerk, or with the, what do they call them, not hostesses, the women at Macy's who help oh, you yeah. buy things. She, she came to the dressing room, yeah, salesperson, and she said, well, the suit looks fine, but that shirt has to go. <laughs> And, and I was able to say to her, the shirt is the one thing that has to say, stay. So I, it was really a process of backing into it. And, and I, I heard some of those echoes with, with those um, women. I guess the, how many minutes? The, the other thing is that one of the things that came to the fore at, at times was um, when I was a fourth year student, there finally were enough women there that we could have women, a, a, a mixed choir. And so, true, I was one of two women in my class of 76 uh, uh, graduates. Um, and so, so we were, the choir was going to be singing at one of the shopping malls in St. Louis, and they asked the choir director what the dress code was. And he said, seminarians were clericals, and women wear long skirts and pretty blouses. And, and I told him later, I said, you're forcing us to choose pretty or pious. Well, he thought that was so funny and alliterative. Um, but, but I decided that it, it was really a pivotal thing for me because I decided my identity um, was more a woman because God had created that. If the church ever ordained me, that was going to be secondary. And that was really, has been very helpful um, throughout the years. I mean, I, I, I didn't have very many part-time jobs at all. I'd have a lot of little jobs, but I... You know, in North Dakota, I was doing supply preaching. I, half the time I was pregnant, and I had a nursing baby along with me. And um, that, it, it actually worked very well. All those farmers in North Dakota, they understood lactation and pregnancy of animals, so <laughs> they, they loved me. Um, but um, it, that, that was, has been an important touchstone that I sometimes, I quit a job in Reno once because my daughter was having trouble. And, and that came first because she was my child as, because I was her mom, because I was a woman. And that, um, so I think that has informed how I have done this work. Um, a lot of it was backing into it because there weren't, um, I was the third woman ordained in my church body. And um, so we found our ways, but you know, integrity always, always works better than following just the rules. So I'll stop there. That's okay. long enough. Thank you. B Bishop Elizabeth? Well, first of all, I feel like um, I'm at a different space. I get to, I am not the first woman bishop of Nevada. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and I get to appreciate, I hope I appreciate enough, all of the doors that have been open. And I have to also just say, it's also because of the Dick Shorey's and the Chris Gardner's and the Kirk Woodliffe's that we get to do what we do because they have stood by us in all of these things that we've, and all the partners out there that have stood by us. Um, my story is a little bit different in that um, I was recruited to the priesthood. I was taken to a Jewish deli around the corner uh, by my priest in Washington, D.C. three times asking me if I would consider ordination. And one of the things he said, I don't understand why this is so hard for you. And I said, I've never seen a woman priest. 
So I'm Gen X, but I had been in church, I'm cradle Episcopalian, so I'd been in church long enough to know that I'd never seen a woman. As I went through the process, somebody was elected presiding bishop and came to St. John's Lafayette Square and preached a sermon that helped me make that decision to become, to go into the discernment process and to become a priest. So that's my story. Bishop Catherine? Certainly. Uh, I was a priest in Oregon uh, starting in what? Uh, I can't remember that year. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I'd been a priest for five years or so and I had some sabbatical time. And I decided that I wanted to, to uh, travel around the Western dioceses to find out how they were doing ministry in their congregations. Um, Nevada is famous for being one of, the, one of the pioneers of what's called total ministry, or used to be called total ministry. It's really about the ministry of all the people. Uh, and I came here as maybe the third or fourth congregation that I wanted to interview. Here. Oh my God! Here, uh, when Britt Olson was the priest here, wow. uh, and she said to me after the conversation, we went off. Uh, it was the night before Ash Wednesday, and we went off and had a conversation. And she said, um, "You know, they're going to elect a bishop here. Um, can I put your name in?" And I said, "What?" That's, that's absolutely insane. Um, I've been a priest for five and a half years. Um, there aren't any women bishops in this part of the world. That people had never heard of them. And I left on Ash Wednesday to drive to Utah to, to interview a congregation there. And then I went on to Wyoming. And then I went down to um, Arizona. And when I started back, um, all of a sudden, I had the sense that it was totally insane, but I was supposed to say yes. <laughs> and I, I expected absolutely nothing, uh, that I would be a, a great foil for the guys in the... In the... <laughs> like Barbara Harris. Yeah, well, I think that's what happens to women or happened in that era. Um, we didn't understand that we had gifts that could be used. Thank you. Rabbi Myra. Obviously. <laughs> See if that helps. Um, so I just want to note that I became a ballroom dancer because of Britt Olson. So I just want to throw that in here. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, the, the thing that struck me uh, watching, watching this film, even now, um, and it's, um, I am coming up on, when was I ordained? 78? So I'm coming up on uh, 46 years, I guess, since I was ordained. Um, and it's now the case in uh, my movement that of um, the, the rabbis that are not retired, um, because over the years there's been more and more women, that there's now about, we're now about 50% of, of my rabbinic organization. We're about a third of the organization, but that's because there's a lot of us old folks who, who have retired, and those folks are overwhelmingly male because there weren't women then. But even after all of that, I was so struck by this, um, how tenuous the um, accomplishment of um, ordained women is. And what struck me um, particularly was that at that first, what do they call it, convention? What's the, okay. So at that first convention, the vote for ordaining women was actually closer than the next one, two years later, right? It had gone backwards. And <clears throat> in our case, the first woman ordained, Sally Priestend, 
um, who was ordained in 72. There was something in the water in the early 70s. That was really good <laughs> stuff. <clears throat> but when Sally was first accepted um, to the seminary, the way, we, the way it works for us is we're ordained uh, really as kind of a graduation from the seminary. So the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the seminary, is the one who ordains us. Um, and there's a board of directors and they have to agree. But if, if he's on board, and they've all been he's, um, if he's on board, that's what was going to make it happen. It was going to take that person to decide to push ahead. And when Sally was accepted to the seminary, there was, um, the head of the seminary was a man named Nelson Glick. And Nelson Glick was a very famous um, archaeologist in the Middle East. And he happened to be married to Helen Glick, who was, um, who was a doctor. Um, and Nelson Glick was committed to ordaining Sally, the first woman. And a year before she was to be ordained, he died. And there was, um, there was no guarantee that the next person in was going, was going to have um, the same orientation. And now I want to stop just because I need to give honor to this woman. Sally was actually not the first woman ordained as a rabbi. There was a woman named Regina Jonas um, during Nazi Germany times who was actually ordained. And exactly this happened to her, except it didn't come out as well. Um, she found uh, it, that there was a, the, it was the Talmud professor at the seminary in Berlin who did the ordaining, who agreed to ordain her, and he died before she was ordained, and the next guy in would have none of it. So there was a big, um, eventually she found a way to make it work, but there was a big, a big obstacle that came up. In, in Sally Preesen's case, the next person in was Alfred Gottschalk, who stayed with Nelson Glick's commitment and ordained her. But Sally talks often, and Regina Jonas, the woman um, under Nazi Germany, her story was lost for decades um, and only recently rediscovered. And I was part of a, a group of uh, early women who went, and there's a plaque up to her now in uh, Theresienstadt. Um, she was eventually murdered in Auschwitz. Um, but, but it could have gone for Sally, I mean, Sally thinks about it all the time, that it could have gone exactly the other way for her, that after Nelson Glick died, had the next person in said, no, 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 I'm not having any of this, um, she, she would have been back to square zero, or minus whatever. Um, so I just, um, uh, um, and, then, you know, and then here we are in 2024, where it seems like so many of the things that we thought were won have now been lost again. Um, and so that I am uh, really, really, I was, I was struck by that, um, in, in the, the, that it's really tenuous. And, um, w you know, we, we've nev it's never done. Um, and, we, and equality is not something we've ever absolutely uh, won in any sphere, and we just can't count on it. So we just keep fighting on, don't we? Because what else can we do? Thank you. Reverend Tanya. So I wrote my biography for this in a little bit of a confusing way. I was actually working at a church in Virginia, but ordained in Arizona. Oh. Um, but it was in the church in Virginia that I was working as a parish admin that I first, I was, my husband was already a seminarian. We had gone to seminary and I was like, I'm behind you a thousand percent, but I don't want anything else to do with seminary. Like I'm here for you. But while I was there, there was a church that was looking for a temp admin, and we needed some extra money, so I signed up and said, I, I interviewed, I loved the church, I was hired, and it ended up being a transformative experience for me, because I was working in a church where the rector, the associate, and the assistant rectors were all women. And I had been from a Catholic background where I had obviously never seen that before. And when I started to discern my own call, aside from thinking that it was truly just bonkers, like maybe there was something in the water that I was drinking, you know, I mean, at seminary, so you think, well, who knows? But it became clear to me that the women around me were naming the gifts that I had as pastoral gifts, as ministry, as ministry. And it was because of them that I began to be able to see that in myself. And so I look at the Philadelphia 11 with such um, admiration, because for me, my holy imagination, I couldn't, I did not have enough of a holy imagination to see myself in a role. 
that I had never seen another woman take. It was only when I saw women in that role that I could imagine it for myself. And one of the things that struck me about the documentary was how these women were asked to represent so much, <laughs> so much more than just themselves. And I recalled when I was doing a chaplaincy internship in the Outer Banks. I was ordained to the diaconate. And I was in North Carolina. I had been up in Virginia, at seminary in Virginia, with all of these cool female professors and cool ordained women and all of these women I was working with. But in the Outer Banks, I was rare and unusual. And when I showed up with my collar, even though I was, I was a deacon, I was brand new, and I was trying to figure out what ordained identity meant for myself. But I realized really quickly that for a number of the people that I met in that small area, that little corner of the world, I was the only female ordained person that they would see. And so the pressure was amplified because it wasn't just how am I going to live authentically as an ordained woman into my call, but also how are people going to receive women clergy period if, they, if their only impression is the one that they get from me. And I was struck by how monumental that was for the women who undertook that in the very beginning. And they talked about the toll that it took on them, on their physical health even, to be that forward. I was in just a little corner of the world and they were on such a, such a huge stage. Thank you. You've all spoken really eloquently about your own experience and what the last 50 years really of history has involved for women. And we're gonna be looking ahead, but before we do that, I want a couple of the questions that have come in from the group. Uh, Bishop Catherine are for you. And uh, the question they're asking is, what difficulty did you find uh, becoming the first woman presiding bishop and having uh, won that in a contested election over six other uh, male nominees. Uh, how was that for you? And a follow-up question is, uh, were some of those that initially resisted your elevation, um, did they come around and were they helpful? How, what was that experience like? I didn't, I didn't understand this until after the election, but it became clear that some of the maybe hold I'll try it down. Let me see if I can keep it in place. Okay. Um, after after the uh, election, I discovered that some of the mo more more. Uh, Conservative okay. bishops in the church uh, colluded with each other to uh, vote for me and cause a difficulty, a, a, a major, a major uh, difficulty in the church uh, by having a woman bishop. Uh, they expected that it would uh, increase their power in the church. I think, in some way. And before too long, uh, they were gone. They left. Um, they didn't want women clergy. There were still four, four dioceses that didn't ordain women when I was elected. And the bishops in those dioceses and several others um, voted for me to cause a, an upset in the church, I was told. Uh, the reality is that the church has always uh, had the challenge of uh, trying to serve all people in the community. Uh, and when one group doesn't get precedence, it can be challenging. And I wrestled with that reality the whole time I was presiding bishop. Mm. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Myra? I just want to say something, Catherine, because I will never forget that service where you were elevated to, to be the national, the head of the church nationally. It, what, what this woman did was so amazing. It was the most inclusive 
it was, it, it just was, I, I, I just can't tell you, it was just such a joy. Um, there was, there were Native Americans, I was a part of it, there was a, an Arab Muslim woman who was a part of it, there was dancing, there was, uh, it, it just, it, it was astounding. Um, and if, if ever anyone has wondered um, what happens to our religious institutions when they are fully open to all of us, you know, that, that, should, that should be the, that should be the uh, video that everyone gets to see. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it uh, speaks to the optics, I think, that over these years, particularly early on, just seeing a woman priest, Elizabeth, um, and then seeing a woman bishop, uh, it just was incredibly powerful for those of us that before 1974 didn't imagine that it was ever going to happen. And uh, these anecdotes are, are really, really helpful. I wanted to uh, just look ahead a bit now, given where we are, 50 years, but it's clear from what you've all shared that there's uh, more progress to be made. And I want you to speak to that in one question particularly. Uh, touches my heart because it's about uh, the imagery and the view of God as a male. And I need to share that when I had that insight that uh, the Episcopal Church very patriarchal and no women in, in uh, the ministry, and priests or bishops, um, and realized that part of the problem too was the whole language of the liturgy and the enormity of trying to make those changes. But I've always believed in, you know, one at a time. So in raising my very young children, they, we started saying, um, our father, mother, who art in heaven. And I have to say that then they would go to church and they'd say that and people in the pews around them would be rather startled. And, <laughs> but they never saw it differently. And you know, there was this always bedtime ritual that my mother did for me and I did for my kids, which was, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bless this bed you lie upon, four angels round your bed, etc. Well, I changed it to Matthew, Martha, Mary, John, <laughs> bless this bed you lie upon. And I realized that just, you know, language is huge, you know, coming from cultural anthropology, language is everything and so shapes the way we think that I wanted to start on my own kids and having them see the divine order as more gender balanced than what the liturgy at church was teaching. It was, of course, an uphill battle. But I mention that because one of these questions is, how limited are we with the view of God as male? And how has that and continue to hold us back in any way if it does? And um, since you didn't have time to think about this, I'll uh, start at this end. <laughs> Why not pick on the newcomer? Or I could, I could actually invite I don't, each one of you, if you don't want to speak to that, maybe you don't need to. I would be surprised if you each didn't. But if there's somebody that is really just compelled to speak to that, uh, let's hear from you first, and I won't pick on uh, Reverend Tanya. Well, I don't mind speaking speaking first, and then everybody else can remember the wisdom that comes after me more easily. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think that for many of us, I remember as a child, my image of God was a great grandfather in the sky. Like, and my dad is a retired Marine, so it wasn't just a great grandfather, but it was a great grandfather with a crew cut, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's that kind of the imagery that we have when we say our father can feel very literal. And I think we know for many people, there's a wound there with their own experiences, with father figures that weren't able to be the people that they wished they had been. So it's not only important um, in terms of like you said, our language is not just descriptive, but it's constructive. We mm -hmm. understand our world based on the words that we use. So it's not only important in a, being able to imagine things differently, to expand our holy imaginations, um, but it's also important to be able to move beyond that, to understand God as healer and redeemer, to understand God as um, 
the one who restores us so that we can move away from the image of the human fathers that sometimes are wonderful and sometimes not. Um, I think maybe I'll let the wisdom of the group go from there. Thank you. Myra, you look like you wanted to speak to that. So, so I have to say, in, in a way, I mean, I come from a tradition that doesn't have an incarnate dude. So, <laughs> so we, we, weren't, uh, we weren't fighting that, okay? <laughs> Um, but that didn't make a whole lot of difference, but, but we weren't fighting that. But um, even with, and I mean no offense to any Christian in this room with what I'm going to say now, even with that, it seems to me that for all of our traditions, to only see God in male terms, um, you know, use the language and then all the cultural baggage that goes on, the male pronouns and the male nouns and all that stuff, I don't see how that is anything short of blasphemy. I just, I mean, it's just obvious to me. If, if God is supposed to be, you know, the whole, all the possibilities, how on earth could anyone ever justify the, the kind of, the, the limiting that the gender stuff does? And it, it seems, I mean, it just seems so obvious. It's like, okay, why would anybody have to say that? Well, because we know institutions are entrenched and the people who had the privilege are entrenched, and the words reflect that, right? But it, it, it seems to me, um, and someday I'll think this through really carefully and, you know, maybe write a PhD or something. Who knows? Probably not. But um, <laughs> at least for us, we went kind of in stages um, with equality. And the first thing was just having women. I mean, you didn't have to do anything more than that. The next thing that happened was we started changing language, but we started changing, I think, um, more um, of the human pronouns. So when we would talk about our ancestors, we wouldn't just talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We'd talk about Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, you know? And I'm on a campaign for Bilha and Zilpa, by the way, just <laughs> while we're here. I just want to, I just want to, that's my latest campaign. Um, and, and, and we would change some of the nouns as well. But eventually, um, and, and it took a long time, and I think we're still there, because I think this is such a... Um, an important and large task. It's not just about the presence of us, and it's not just about changing the nouns and pronouns. It's really about changing what we believe God is and can be. Um, it's, it's, it's way beyond the words. And, and I really was struck in here when they, um, when it, very early on, when they were doing um, um, adjectives on God, one of the ones they used, I think, was lover. Now, where do you see that in most of our liturgies, you know? And that, that's a hugely important notion, not because of the word, because of what it, what it opens up, up for us in terms of our theological understanding. And so that's the place that I think we've, maybe now, I hope, we are really, really pushing for. And the fact that we, we could never have gotten there when, when the representatives that we saw were men and the language that we saw were men. And I just, it's a travesty. I mean, blasphemy is the only word I know for that. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about that? Yeah, I'm going to say something short. Um, my parents sent me to a Roman Catholic convent school starting at age five. And I was there for three, four years. Um, and all of our teachers were women, nuns, uh, in full habits in those days. Uh, when, we, when we met one in the hall, we had to curtsy and say, good morning, mother so-and-so. Um, Right. No, no, no. They were they were female names, <laughs> um, and they were they were gentle and very firm at the same time. I didn't have an issue with the uh, male maleness in that context. When I went to a coeducational public school after that period, a couple of years. Um, I discovered that boys could take wood shop and metal shop, and girls could take sewing, sewing. and cooking. cooking. 
And boys could take sewing and cooking, but girls couldn't take wood shop and metal shop. And I was absolutely furious. And my mother wouldn't go to the school board and beat on them. <laughs> um, that, that formation as a young person um, really helped me to understand that we're all supposed to have access, all of us, whoever we are. Great. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Ruth, something to add? Yeah, I, I just remember um, in the early years, maybe the early 80s, there was a lot more conversation about finding the, the feminine images of God. Um, Phyllis Tribble wrote a book, that God and the Rhetoric of Sexuality. And so in Isaiah 11, when God says, I bound up your wounds, you know, that's the image of a mother putting a Band-Aid on and, and things like that. And I have discovered, uh, though, as just even that you asked that question, I am far less bothered by all of that or, or feel the need to point it out uh, at this stage than in that earlier time. But I think that's because I've grown into my vocation. And so the things that I notice when I'm working, I, I have a pericope group that's online, uh, that's text study yeah. and uh, for sermons. And I noticed that the things that I notice, and the other woman in the group who's a Latvian pastor, um, they come out of our experiences as women, and that informs my preaching. I also notice how women preside at the table differently. I love watching you. It's my favorite thing to do. Really? Well, yes. I mean, after PBS Murder Mysteries, but it, the next <laughs> thing is... I, the most eligible Lord of London. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But because there's, a, but, but women have done a lot of serving of food, and for me, that's what is going on there, and and um, and I, I, no names, but sometimes men get in this place where they just rattle it right off, and blah, 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 and it's um, and it is so distracting, and I think. You know, a, a woman, uh, sing, even when they're bringing the elements to the altar, you know, it's like a woman making a pot of chili or something, and her friend brings her a bowl of onions, uh, and she just dumps them in. She doesn't have to bow for it either, but they, you just get the onions, you dump them in. But there's, there's a little more, for me, an organic... Um, I, I, it's what women have been doing for generations, of making food and serving a meal, and you sink into the liturgy, which is so powerful. And, and you don't need a whole lot of uh, extra motions and bowing and scraping, I don't think, um, because the words are so powerful. But I do notice that women do the liturgy differently than men, typically. Mm. And, and because, because women are informing that, the, the images of God don't bother me as much. So... Bishop Elizabeth, anything to add? Well, my really quick... Uh, what, that may, what this brought for me is... Um, do not be afraid, right? We just don't need to be afraid of looking at God in an image that we can resonate with. So if that's a woman, okay. And if it's a man, it's okay. Or if it's a being that we can't wrap our arms around, I feel like that's okay. I think one of the things that gets in our way is our own fear. And when I say our own fear, not ours necessarily, but like those bishops that were so afraid of what would happen if we had a woman be ordained, that was all fear-based. Mm -hmm. Instead of what Jesus taught us, which is love, or even going, he uses Deuteronomy and Numbers, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So if we enter into these spaces in love, instead of fear, it, you know, maybe God is a butterfly. I mean, right, whatever works, as long as it gets you to love. Great, thank you. <clears throat> We're going to close with one final question, and I'll ask all the panelists to address it, and then I have just a couple of closing comments to make. Um, this is bringing us into a real contemporary focus here. The documentary records a time of angry schism, schism in the Episcopal Church. Um, and uh, what I want to ask you about, how does that, and what we saw and what we've experienced, how does that inform your thinking about today and the deep and bitter divisions we see in American society? 
Elizabeth Bishop, go. Uh, so I was thinking a lot about this question. Just We got a heads up, I think, last night or this morning about yeah. this. Honestly, we've been in schism our whole lives, right? Moses leaves, leads the Israelites out of slavery, and they get mad at him, and, uh, right? And Jesus is in the temple, and they get mad at him. And it's over and over and over, right? Just we're always mad at each other about everything all the time. So I don't feel like this is new. Mm -hmm. I feel like we are called as the church to be the bridge in the gap. Mm -hmm. We are called to bring together the culture that is struggling with the ideal world that God has shown us. It is very good. And that, I think, is what we, that's what we do as a church or a synagogue or a, a mosque. We are called to bridge the gap between anger and division and remind people to go back to that beautiful creation that God made where everything is good. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Ruth, you want to go? Yes. Um, I, um, I, when I had the question, I kind of went to the political divisions that we have, and so I don't want to offend anybody, regardless of your Republican or Democrat, but um, I think it's been well written that some of the fuel uh, for um, the, the right is that there are a lot of um, white folk who are feeling threatened. Um, and they feel disadvantaged, and they hate the educated elites and so forth. David Brooks, among others, have written about this. Um, but, and so immigrants are an issue, um, educated, as I said, educated elites and so forth. Even the AARP had an article on, are you afraid to invest for your retirement? And it was all these simple helps on people who don't know how to, who are afraid of, you know, the stock market or anything. And I, I was blown away by the the level of that, that there are actually people who are afraid to, to take those kinds of risks, which for some of us are just really normal. But um, so uh, w what was true for me at seminary is that there, while there were very few of us, um, the church body that w had broken apart, w we didn't have very many churches. We had a whole lot of clergy and we had this joke about, and we had a lot of bishops, so, you know, there'd be 100 bishops and 30 pastors and, you know, 10 lay people at your, at your ordination, because we didn't have churches. And, um, uh, but, but there were, whenever a, a group is breaking in, uh, a minority group is breaking into a new field, those individuals have to be smarter than the average bears. You just have to be top-notch, because you have to prove that you can do it, but also you've got to be made of a certain kind of steel that even has some emotional bandwidth to do that as well. And, and so, um, because in my church body, there weren't going to be calls for the less, um, the slightly below average men, uh, women became a, a double threat there. Um, not only will we have fewer, but the women then were going to be taking the jobs away from the men. As it turned out, it didn't. My first call was ecumenical ministry at UNLV, and nobody actually wanted that particular job. So, um, but I met Bishop Prenzdorf that way. Um, so, um, and, and so I see that still going on, that elite thing. Sorry. Well, I just want to ask you to be a little bit brief. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I know. I know. Ruth. Ruth. Yeah, sorry. And, okay, uh, let's move on down the line. Uh, Bishop Catherine? It is green. Um, when I was wandering around Nevada regularly, particularly at the beginning, uh, I, the people taught me. Uh, I was in a very rural congregation one time, and I asked one of the fellows at coffee hour how many cattle he had. <laughs> Wrong, <laughs> wrong, but a very gentle response. We don't do that around here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think our, our major challenges in this society, in this state, um, in this nation, in the world, is that we're not willing to be curious about mm, others. Good. That we're, because when we have to ask others about what they do or what they believe, um, there's an opportunity for conversation. 
and conversation generates conversion. Mm -hmm. um, it draws us into a circle uh, that can be much holier and more whole and real than just saying, those people over there. We have to go look. Well said. Thank you, Myra. Okay. Um, if you follow me, I wish you well. <laughs> um, and Jill, I'm counting on you to okay. rescue this from what I'm about to say. Okay. Um, Briefly. Yeah. I, I am usually really, really an optimistic kind of naive soul. I am that no more. For all the, um, you know, death threats that some of those women got and things like that in their days, I think it is exponentially worse now. Um, fueled partly by social media where everything can get, you know, blown up 9,000 million times. Um, and I think about, um, you know, people mad at judges and coming to their houses and, and shooting their children dead um, or, or coming to the home of, a, of an elected uh, official's spouse and axing an 80-year-old man. Um, I, think, I, I think there is no comparison uh, in terms of the divisiveness and the violence and the toxicity that we are seeing now to what was going on at that time, even though, you know, we now have more women in the, you know, ordained and all that, all that stuff. I um, mean, I just think it has exponentially worsened. Um, and I don't, for the life of me, know what we, what we can do about it, but we sure better do something because it is, t to me, it is terrifying. Great, thank you. And Reverend Tanya, last word on this. <laughs> um, so I've, noticed in my own ministry that I've often been attracted to smaller things. You know, I have a number of colleagues who uh, would go and be involved in big protests and big actions, and I always admired them, but I always felt drawn to the smaller things. So I have experienced that also in terms of conflict. I think schism's a big word, right? Like schism's huge and terrifying. Um, but also, I think that there are conflicts that on the regular we could actually address in a healthier way. And in the church, that seems to also be true. We, sometimes I had a colleague that wrote his thesis um, talking about the break when Gene Robinson was consecrated and saying that it's not like Gene, that like that suddenly happened at that consecration that the conflict preceded that. And that um, in his thesis, he wrote about papering over, sort of pretending that conflict doesn't exist because we don't want to be ugly or disagreeable with one another. And instead, that there's an opportunity for us to learn how to engage in conversations that might be difficult, that we disagree with one another about, but that we can still, um, that that we can respect each other. I don't want to be naive when you said naive and optimistic. I don't want, um, but that there's a way to engage with one another. Um, when Bishop Catherine talked about curiosity, it reminded me of the godly play, I wonder statements. You know, I wonder, it's like expanding sort of, I wonder why you think that. I wonder what it is that made, that made this feel like the position that is right to you, or I wonder, this sort of curiosity. So I think that there's ways that the church can actually be an important locus for healthy conflict and healthy conversation and resolution because we're already starting from a place that we know that we're called to love God and love one another. So we already have that in common. We can actually work on, on some of those issues together. Thank you. Um, I, um, when I was watching the video. Initially, I was struck by a, a quote about those uh, Philadelphia 11, a Margaret Mead quote that I've often called upon. A Margaret Mead, a early cultural anthropologist, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. Yeah. And I think of the bravery of those 11 but I want to also acknowledge the bravery of the men that supported them. Mm -hmm. 
I think we don't often give men thank you. I've been in this cause a long time, and I have to tell you, the support of the men that have worked alongside to advance the status of women and, and, make, and build a better society, a fairer, more balanced, balanced society, have made a huge difference, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. I want to say about those 11 women that they were clearly trailblazers, as were the men, the clergy that supported them, and the others. But we have here today trailblazers who continue to be trailblazers. You know, in a way, in this divided world that we're living in, and this disrupted, difficult world we're living in, we're all really called to be trailblazers. We're all people of the book, which is the Muslim expression for those that derive their religion from the Old Testament. And I think in a way we're called all to be in our ministries uh, trailblazers at this difficult time we live in. But I want you to join me in acknowledging a terrific panel. Of <laughs> Um, Reverend Kirk, I believe you're going to dismiss us with a prayer. Oh, you're doing, okay. You're on. This book came to me from, it's called Women's Uncommon Prayers. And uh, before the prayer, I just want to read this. For making me a woman in what still so often seems a man's world, I thank you because you taught me by example that power is your gift and not my possession. For giving me a body through, though it sometimes fails me and is not what I wished it was, or rather, it's a good deal more than I wished it was, I thank you. Because you taught me that I am much more than my body and yet my body is a holy temple. For calling me to be more than I believe I can be, and less than I sometimes pretend I am. I thank you, because you taught me that being is more than doing, that who I am and whose I am are more important than what I do or what I have. For all that you are, creator, redeemer, sanctifier, great I am, I bless you as you have greatly blessed me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the possibilities of common mission that you place before us. As Ruth and Naomi reached across the cultural divide to love and care for one another, may we embrace one another in sisterly solidarity and inviting our brothers to walk with us. In our towns, in our cities, rural areas and campuses, may we enliven our communities as we join together to work and witness in your name. As women and men of faith, we know that there is always too much work to be done, too little time to do it, and too few people to get it done. We know that pride and posturing often get in the way of coming together in your service. We know that mission often gets more talk than action, but we also know that joy and power can be found in the companionship and creation into which you invite us. As we affirm that you call us to common mission, may we as women and men of faith untie that which binds us and dismantle that which divides us. By your grace, may we gather these ropes and tails that limit our lives and our communities and weave them into one creation. May we, through our prayers and plans and programs, pursue the possibilities you set before us in your call to common mission always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and special thanks to the group from St. Paul's yes. who's put this together. It's really been terrific.